My name is Alex. I work at Google, so I build stuff at Google Scale, and I break stuff at Scale. Well, we all break stuff, and my name is Mikita Partsenko. I worked at Netflix. Today we'll give you an overview of a few patterns, tools, and approaches you can use to build fault-tolerant systems. It should give you some ideas how to improve your system on different levels. But first of all, what is fault-tolerance? What does it mean for your system to be fault-tolerant? Does it mean that your system shouldn't have any failures or faults or errors? Let's tell them apart first, because faults, errors, and failures are different things. Modern software systems are built using many components, layers, parts. Today we have separate microservices. They talk to each other, and some of the components will fail or produce a fault. I know nothing about your system, but I can promise that some of its components will produce a fault, and some of them may be failing right now. And the more components you have, the more faults you get. And a fault is an event of incorrect internal state in your system High latency of your database is a fault. A hole in your spaceship is a fault. Trees hitting power lines are a fault, but it's not a failure yet. By itself, it's not even an error. An error is a visibly incorrect behavior. It's when your system misbehaves and your users notice. It may be returning incorrect results. It may be returning 500s. Your lights may be flickering. Your users notice, but the system still works. By and large, a failure is when your system doesn't work. It may be unreachable, it may be unresponsive, it may be something else, but the bottom line is still the same. The main functionality is broken. The power is out, you're facing a blackout, like the one in 2003, then 55 million people lost power because of some trees hitting power lines. So a fault like that can cause an error. An error can produce a failure, sometimes a catastrophic one. So given these terms, a fault-tolerant system is the one that doesn't crash when fault happens or when multiple faults occur at the same time. On the other hand, fault-intolerant fault system will crash and might require a restart after a fault. It will kill itself and you will need to start it from scratch. It's even worse because most complex systems cannot be fixed with a simple restart. It may be impossible or it can make things worse. Let's take a look at these two famous real-world examples. What's the difference between those two? Well, one was a catastrophic failure. In another, everybody survived. And on the first look, Titanic was designed with fault tolerance in mind. Remotely activated watertight doors, bulkheads, lifeboats. But it was just an appearance. In reality, Titanic design missed some crucial fault tolerance practices, and it ended up in a catastrophe. They hit an iceberg. That was a fault. When water got inside the ship, that was very visible error that led to a failure, to a catastrophe. On the other hand, in 2009, Captain Salenberg safely landed his plane on the river of Hudson after a collision with Canada geese. It was pretty severe and unpredictable fault. When engines went out, that was a clear error, and users on that plane noticed that. But it wasn't a catastrophic failure. Everybody survived. What made the difference? Planes are designed to tolerate faults. We have given up trying to build a perfect plane. Now we do our best to embrace fault. We try to improve safety after each incident. So as you can see, fault can cause an error. An error can lead to a failure. And this is exactly what we are trying to prevent by building fault tolerance system. Bad things will happen. We cannot prevent faults, but we should be able to prevent failures. And truly high loaded, not high loaded, but fault tolerant and high loaded, of course, system should keep running despite the fault, degrading gracefully, not crashing completely. And fault tolerance requires several things. Right code practices, choosing business priorities, and maintaining a proper communication culture. We are going to cover those topics, talking about design patterns, illustrating them with code snippets, and not just some abstract code snippets. We actually wrote an application and we're going to review it, and we're going to run it live, breaking it and fixing it as we go. And finally, we're going to cover communication patterns that help us maintain fault-tolerant systems. So let's check out our game. In the game, we're going to fly a plane, dodging geese, flying through clouds. And as I said, we actually wrote the code, we compiled it, we deployed it to cloud. So let's take a look. Yeah, because some of you know me uh, for forever in game dev. That's why we have this hashtag. So we build a game, and now 
we'll see. Okay, here's the okay. game. So in the game, you see a plane. And on the right, you see, oh, you see geese and clouds, right? So I'm, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to avoid a collision with geese. If I hit a cloud, nothing happens. If I hit a goose, I will lose one engine. And after I lose all four engines, game is over for me, but everybody survives. And as you can see on the left, I have three engines left. You can see my score, you can see my generated username, and you can see uh, leaderboard, top five users. Now let's check what's under the hood, right? Yeah, let's review the architecture of our system. Okay, three, two, one, going back to slides. So as we said already, we have a GitHub repository with all the code, and you'll be able to check it out later. And our system uses a mix of technologies. Some of the services we implemented using gRPC and others are RESTful. And uh, while we are going to show you some code snippets, this talk is not about gRPC or REST. And for those of you who are not aware of gRPC, don't worry. This talk doesn't require gRPC knowledge at all. And uh, in a nutshell, gRPC is a high-performance RPC framework open sourced by Google. We use it internally at Google, and it's used in other companies like Netflix and others. So we will provide you code for a demo. And solutions we are going to review can be implemented with any technology. Sometimes they are easier to implement using gRPC. Something else is better fit for REST. But we are going to provide you examples for both of them. So we want to show you different flavors of the same patterns where we can. Sending large amounts of geese and clouds seems to be a great fit for gRPC because you might remember we had this gRPC versus REST battle last year and gRPC obviously won. And our first service is geese service. That service generates all these geese. You saw them on the screen, right? And another one for clouds. This generates clouds because geese are birds and they fly in the clouds. So this is not Java Island. So they are not cloud native Java birds. They are just cloud native geese. Sounds like a name for a book. And we also need a leaderboard to record the distance traveled. The longer you can fly without hitting geese, the better. And we're also going to need a gateway to bring all these different services together and provide a client with a unified gRPC interface. And our client is written in JavaScript, and it's using gRPC web, which just became generally available a few weeks ago. And let's review our services in more details now. We have re uh, leaderboard, which provides us with RESTful APIs. And you can hit the first API and get the player score. And you can get the data, change it, send it back to the server using the same REST resource. And then you can hit the second API to get top N scores. So you can actually build a leaderboard and display it to users. This is uh, leaderboard APIs. And GIS and, and Cloud services are gRPC services. And let's take a look at GIS service. GIS service uses protocol buffers because it's gRPC service. If you don't know protocol buffers, don't worry. It's readable. You can read service, GIS service. It has one RPC method, get GIS. It takes GIS request as an argument, and it returns GIS response. And a little known fact, gRPC stands for GIS remote procedure calls. And cloud service has very similar definition. Cloud service has RPC method get clouds, and it returns clouds response. So this GIS response and clouds response, they contain positions for this GIS and clouds that you saw on the screen when we showed you the game. But our client, it doesn't call the services directly. It calls API Gateway. And API Gateway implements fixture service. What is a fixture? Fixture is a combination of GIS and clouds. So fixture response contains positions for both geese and cloud. So client calls it, receives fixture response, and puts geese and clouds on the screen according to this response. And we used gRPC runtime. We generated classes from it. We generated client libraries. And we generated abstract service implementations. And let's go ahead and see how we implemented fixture service. Fixture service extends generate abstract class. And what would be the simplest implementation of fixture service? When client calls API gateway, it can call GIS service, wait for the response. When response is back, it can call cloud service. When cloud service returns cloud's response, it can merge this 
two responses together and send it back as a fixture response to a client, right? Yes, but with this approach, you have two sequential calls. So your latency is the sum of these latencies, these two latency, and that hurts, especially as we scale up. Well, we don't need to send this request sequentially, one by one. We can send two asynchronous calls, right? We can make two calls in parallel and then combine their responses as they're ready. And this way, we don't need to sum their latencies up. And in gRPC, it's easy. We can use future-based tabs. Future-based tabs, they don't block. They return you future on RPC call. And this future is completed later when you have response from this service. So we inject this future-based tab. And when our client calls get fixture, we make a call to GIS service using method get GIS on future-based tab. We immediately return this future of GIS responses. And we make another call from the same thread. We call cloud service. And we receive future of cloud response. And then we combine them together, as we did before. And uh, this GIS and clouds future it's, uh, will be completed later when we have responses from both GIS and clouds services. So asynchronous calls help us to send multiple requests in parallel. And this way, we don't add their latencies up. By, but you might be wondering, what do we do if any of our dependencies is slow? Because, for example, cloud service can be slow, and we don't want to wait forever for it, right? And our client will not wait, wait forever for sure. We need to use timeouts to fix it. In fact, timeouts are number one caveat of building a distributed application. Timeouts provide us predictable latencies for our dependencies. We should have timeouts for all integration points in our system, for every external network call, for every database call, for every file system call. In fact, the very first thing you can do on Monday when you get back to work is add timeouts to a system if they are missing. And in gRPC, it's easy. We just add this deadline after when we make this call. So this deadline after 500 millisecond. We'll make a call with 500 millisecond deadline or timeout. And in REST, we are using a, uh, a future-based HTTP calls as well to avoid blocking a thread. And we need to add timeouts as well so we can get consistent behavior across all our calls. So timeouts guarantee us predictable latency and protect us from slow dependencies. So let's see how it works, right? So we saw a little bit of implementation. And we know that we already know that we made these calls asynchronous. We protected them with timeouts. What can possibly go wrong? Famous last words. Sure, I will show you. Play again. So you see a plane. You see geese. And yeah, they're flying. You can see them there. Oh, no, no clouds. Yeah, and no geese as well. Uh, they're missing. Works for me. I'm the first on the leaderboard. Uh, well, there is no leaderboard as well. It was just missing a second ago. No, it's here. Uh, it's not anymore. Like, we have an error. We have two errors. First, we don't have any fixtures, no clouds, no geese. And second, our leaderboard keeps disappearing. Let's investigate that. Well, to investigate it, I mean, we could open developer console of the application, right? But uh, developer can use developer console to investigate your faults or errors is not the best idea especially if you have to do it in the middle of the night. So to be able to investigate faults, we need proper observability. And good observability starts with monitoring. We need to know technical metrics of our system so we can react when something goes wrong. What we need? We need to know request per second. We need to know latency of each service. We need to know error rates. We need to know status codes. And gRPC, by default, reports all these metrics using open census. This is an open sourced version of the framework we use internally in Google to collect metrics. All you have to do is call register all views, and gRPC starts reporting its metrics using open census. And then you just need to use exporter to export it to the monitoring tool of your choice. So when you investigate an error, that may be useful. But it's not enough, because if you may want to dig into individual requests, inspect call flow of the request, latency on each stage, and so on. And distributed tracing helps with all that. Tracing provides visibility into each step of the request. What services did it hit? How long did it take? When it happened? What is the status of each call? So to have it, you can integrate your 
framework, for example, gRPC with open tracing solution like Zipkin, and here we did exactly that. gRPC integrates with Zipkin, you need to create a tracer and then instantiate interceptors and add those interceptors when you create gRPC server and gRPC client. And, Zip and gRPC starts reporting this response to Zipkin, and Zipkin has very nice UI when you can see call flow. We will demonstrate it later. And in the REST universe, there are libraries that can do this instrumentation for you. For example, if you have a Spring Boot application, all you need to do is add a couple of dependencies and change your application properties to point to your Zipkin collector endpoint, and that's it. Okay, we have proper investigation tools now, we have monitoring, we have tracing. Let's actually find out what the problem is. Sure, let's switch back to our demo. Yep. And make sure it's still broken. It seems like it's still broken. And let's start with traces, right? So here is stack driver view. We use Google Cloud Platform. We deployed our code to Google Cloud Platform. So it has stack driver. And what we can see here is all the calls, right? Or some of the calls. If we click on individual call, we'll see uh, everything we wanted to see. But like let's check out the latest calls because yeah, the they seem to be calls. really slow now. Oh, the latest calls, you can see that latency is over 500 milliseconds. And you can, you can tell it, right, by, by checking these traces. They're up to 500. So, and if I click on individual one, I can check what did it hit. Okay, it hit GetGIS, it was fast, like a few milliseconds. And then it hit clouds, and clouds is kind of slow. 500 milliseconds, and this call fails with deadline exceeded status code. You can see it on the bottom of the screen, right? Deadline exceeded is gRPC timeout. So this get clouds call timed out, and as a result, get fixture call. Yes, it timed out as well. Let me check another trace just to make sure it's okay. consistent. Okay, but you're spot checking, and we may be lucky, or we may be not, and we need more definitive proof to actually continue investigation. Yes, that's right, but uh, well, all the traces I, I checked, they look consistent. They look exactly the same. I have timeout on cloud, and this timeout leads to fixture timeout. But let's check the latencies, right? Because we reported latencies using open sensors. So we have, this is the latency, oh wow. This is latency for cloud service. Orange line is mean latency, and blue line is 99 percentile latency. So we can see that this, those latencies, both of them are over 500 milliseconds. And our timeout is 500 milliseconds. So cloud service is constantly slow. But check, uh, let's check GIS service, right? Latency for GIS. Latency for GIS. OK, this is GIS. It's fast. No, it's not the latest. Let me reload you, it. You need to reload, yep. It's still fast. It's still fast. It's like less than six milliseconds. So my theory is cloud service is constantly slow, and it makes fixture call to timeout. Right. Well, it's a nice theory. It's backed up by data. But what about leaderboard? Because I remember it was blinking, right? Let's investigate that as well. Let's check its traces. Reload. Four minutes ago, it's probably when we saw that. I mean, first of all, they are fast, right? 15 milliseconds, 6 milliseconds. Oh, I see. No, no it's fine. It, they all are good. Can we search for errors? Oh, I see okay. an error. Unknown error. Yeah, we have an error. like. But, but previous trace didn't contain an error. Yeah, let's filter all the traces with errors in them. So stack driver has this uh, query language, so we can filter out everything but errors. So this is failed calls. You see some of, of them yeah, We don't have that many errors. Most of the calls seem to be successful. Can we filter back? Yeah, this is all the calls. Yes, much like more. we have much more calls than we have errors. Yeah, only like three or four so, of them are failed. OK, so we have two theories here, right? So the first theory is. Uh, why we didn't see any GIS in clouds is because cloud service is constantly slow. And another theory is leaderboard uh, fails sometimes, and it makes uh, leaderboard to disappear. Now we have the data. Uh, OK, we have the proper, we have the data, we have consistent theories. Let's actually go ahead and fix that stuff. We know that our cloud service is slow. Uh, and right now, the whole call fails when one of the dependencies fail. And we can partially degrade our functionality, but not returning clouds when cloud service is failing. Because clouds are not a critical part of our system. It's perfectly fine to skip them. And to fix it, we need to switch from futures all as list to futures successful as list. And this will pick up successful GIS results and ignore failed clouds results. 
And this pattern is called par partial degradation. Partial degradation is good, but yes. uh, can we improve user experience? When leaderboard request fails, leaderboard disappears, it's annoying. And we know that all leaderboard calls are fast, but some of them return an error. What we can do about it? Well, we can retry a call because we know that returning an empty leaderboard is annoying. But we know that leaderboard doesn't fail too often, and we know that it's fast, so the chances are the next time we try, we're going to get successful result. And to do that, we need to wrap our future base call in a function, and then we need to define our retry policy. Let's say we're going to retry up to five times, and then we're going to use failsafe library to apply that policy to provide us with a retryable call. Why five times? I bet everybody has three as a max retry. Well, well, it's up to you. You decide. And retries, they give us better user experience when we are dealing with intermittent failures. So actually, let's go ahead and deploy and try our fixes. So we can deploy our fixes, because the only way to verify that we are right is to deploy them and check yeah, their life. help. Otherwise, they're otherwise, it's still a hypothesis, right? Yes. OK. Let's we can go. talk all, all we want, but we need to run the code to, to see actually that it works or it doesn't work. Yep. Let's play a game first. Uh, no geese. Uh, it should take a few seconds to propagate. OK, oh, there are geese. Geese are, geese are back. But we don't see any clouds. Yes. Do we? No. They're not cloud native geese anymore. And leaderboard is not blinking. So our fixes seems to be working, but let's check the traces to make sure that we are not cheating or check latencies. Let's check latencies. I mean, here is the latency. It's still high. Let me reload to make sure it's about. Yeah, that's the latest. Yes, it's still high, right? So our call probably fails. I mean, let's check traces, no problem. Uh, just now is the latest trace. I click on it, and I see that it didn't fail, right? OK. Yeah, can, can you check the actual and status latency, code? And latency is, is, uh, is high. And let's yes. check the game. Yeah, so, so it's working. Yeah. We, we got the data to, to prove that our fixes are working. So we can go back to our slides now. OK, it seems like it helped. But you might be wondering at this point why we retried failed leaderboard calls, but we didn't retry cloud calls. Well, we know that clouds are consistently slow. And when you're facing a timeout, retrying it doesn't make sense because your main call probably has timed out as well by, by the time your dependency timeout. So adding more latency to a failed call makes no sense. So we need to decide which faults we should retry on. For example, you may want to retry on network failures and don't retry on timeouts. And if you enable retries in gRPC, for example, by default it will retry on unavailable status code, but it will not retry on deadline exceeded status code, which makes perfect sense. Also, with the retries, we're increasing the number of requests to a service that is sick already, and adding load to a sick service is hurting it, it's killing it. And this anti-pattern is called a retry storm. How do I avoid it? First of all, a sick service needs some breathing room to recover. And we can provide that breathing room by using exponential backoffs. We may want to wait 100 milliseconds after first failed call, 200 after the th after a second one, 400 after the third one, and so on and so on. But what if I don't want to retry a failed call? Well, we can just rely on a fallback, like a hard-coded value. We can return an empty leaderboard. Or even better, we can use a last known good value, because a stale leaderboard is better than no leaderboard at all. Or we can throw an exception right away. For example, if you're buying something with your credit card, you don't want to rely on your cashed account balance. And you want to avoid retries to make sure you don't get any duplicate charges. And that must be a product decision, not a technical one. This must be a product decision, but there is a technical caveat as well. We can only retry when our calls are idempotent, meaning multiple calls we leave the system in the same state. And as, and as we discussed, retrying every single call is not the best idea, especially for slow calls. And speaking of slow calls, here is somewhat typical latency distribution. What do we have here? We have pretty good mean latency. It's less than 50 milliseconds or around 50 milliseconds. But our 99 percentile latency is not great. It's over 500 milliseconds. But overall, it's not so bad. Our mean latency is really low. Most of the requests are fast. You're right, most of the requests. And only one out of 100 of requests will take more than 500 milliseconds, and it will time out. It's called tail latency. With tail latency, 
If you have a client that issues 100 requests a minute and each of them has 1% probability to time out, what is the chance the user will face a timeout? Any guesses? Well, Anyone? it's the whole 63%. If a user see an error with more than 50% probability each minute, they will, be, they will be very unhappy. So when you scale up, a typical tail latency may lead to unusable system and to unhappy users. And what can we do about it? We need to be tail tolerant. Let's see what we can do. When we send a request and it has two millisecond deadline, and there is no response in 100 millisecond. In this point, at this point, we kind of know that request is slow. So we, what we can do, we can send second request. We can preemptively issue a second call. It's not a retry because deadline is not reached yet. Now we have two requests in fly, and we use the first response from any of these two calls. This approach is called request hedging. This way, we can reduce our tail latency, and the probability of timeout for our case drops from 63% to less than a percent. It can be a great trade-off to sacrifice some throughput for better tail latencies and user experience. And gRPC will soon support request hedging out of the box. All you will need to do is to enable retry and set max hedge attempts, and gRPC will do request hedging for you. So request hedging. It's very useful when not all of your requests are slow, and second call has a good chance to return faster. So request hedging helps us to achieve tail tolerance. But what if we have another kind of latency distribution? This kind of graph is very common when you have an upstream service that is overloaded. Let's do some math. If we have, if we have a mean latency that is larger than I time out, then each request has more than 50% probability of failure. And with 100 requests combined, the total probability of failure is almost 100%. And hedging or retrying is not going to help much here in a real life scenario. Uh, it doesn't make sense to whip a dying horse. It's better to give it a chance to recover. And we can do it by stopping all calls to affected service altogether. With no request, it gets a chance to recover or restart. And we still need to do a health check every now and then. So when it passes, we can resume the normal traffic flow to the service. And this well-known pattern is called circuit breaker, and it's implemented by such libraries as failsafe and hysterix. It lets us fail fast, and failing fast is one more strategy of processing an error. So now you know what you can do when your service is unavailable or slow. And again, that must be a product decision. And with slow services, we have at least one more issue. Client can already fail with a timeout, but if services are not aware of that, they can still make calls and overload the system. So we need to properly choose deadlines that can be not as easy as it sounds. Let's say we have a client that calls API Gateway, and Gateway calls cloud service, and cloud service calls another service. It can be like weather service. So cloud service makes a call and figures out how many clouds to put on the screen depending on the weather. It doesn't matter now. And if client has 200 millisecond deadline and gateway spent 120 milliseconds processing this request, and it makes a call to cloud service, and cloud service works for another 90 milliseconds, at this point, our deadline of 200 milliseconds is exceeded on client side. So client already failed. But if cloud service doesn't know it, it can still decide to make the call to weather service. And these calls, they're just waiting our resources, they propagate slowness, they take our time, and they overload the system. gRPC helps us to avoid these issues with deadline propagation. If you have a call that has 200 millisecond deadline and API gateway spends 120 milliseconds processing this request, when it makes a call to a cloud service, its deadline will be only 80 milliseconds. gRPC will automatically adjust the deadline based on time already spent and set this deadline together with the request. And if cloud service works for another 90 milliseconds and client fails already with timeout or deadline, gRPC knows that there is no deadline left and it will not even try to make outgoing call to weather service. So this way, we are not wasting our resources and time for requests that already failed on 
color side and gRPC supports deadline propagation out of the box. This is one more pattern that helps us to make sure the system is not overloaded. And we know what kind of latency we can handle using deadline propagation and timeouts. And after we do load testing, we know we can know how much throughput we can handle. And we know that additional throughput uh, will lead to degraded performance. And what can we do about that? Well, we can start rejecting requests over some known health limit. For example, if you know that our service can handle 1,000 simultaneous requests, we can just drop 1,000 first. Yes, this pattern is called load shedding, but how do we find that limit? It's a good question. The best load test is the one that you run in production, right? When your service starts queuing up and coming request, you know the, it might hit its concurrency limit, right? And anything above this limit probably should be rejected. This way we don't overload the system and we keep it healthy. Yes, we can dynamically identify this limit. This approach is called adaptive concurrency limits, and Netflix open sourced the library to address exactly that problem and the name of the library. Can you guess it? It's probably G concurrency limits. Well, it's Netflix, not Google, so it's just concurrency limits. The name might not be fancy, but the library works, and it supports both REST and gRPC. And in REST, all you need to do is add a servlet filter and specify an initial limit, that, which will be adjusted later. Hold on, but this way, you limited throughput for all the users and all the requests, right? What if I have free users and premium users, and I want to guarantee throughput for premium users, even when free users are overwhelming the system? Well, we can certainly partition the traffic in REST. We can partition it by an HTTP header. So here we have a GIS type header, and we guarantee 90% of the throughput for our premium GIS. So pay for your GIS to get guaranteed throughput. And again, prioritizing request types must be a product decision. And we can use it in gRPC as well. In gRPC, that was not me. Yes, we're breaking stuff, but not here. <laughs> Something breaks. But uh, I hope it will not lead to a catastrophic failure. Me too. OK, so in gRPC, you can create a limiter. And you can partition by header, by method, by other things. And then you create an interceptor, and you add this limiter, and add it when you create your gRPC server. Also, this library provides client and currency limits. It protects upstream services from a caller side. The approach is similar. We limit number of connections, but we limit number of outgoing concurrent requests to a given upstream service to avoid overloading it. So as you can see, concurrency limits help to provide us with a predictable throughput. Well, phew, that's a lot. Timeout, concurrency limits, deadline propagation. Let's try everything on scale. Anybody wants to try the game, Alex is going to show you the URL you can go to and actually play it. So open your phones, put them into landscape mode, open your laptops. The game is supported on Google Chrome and Safari. And right. Put it landscape mode and you will be able to control your plane with your phone. Yes, and we are going to have the small competition, so the best pilot will get this awesome stuff, Canadian Goose. Uh, and, and glory, of course. Of course, glory. And we're going to load test not just our system, but the conference, uh, conference Wi-Fi as well. They already start breaking it. Yeah, I hope so. So we'll try our best to keep our plane up in there. So meanwhile, while people are playing, let's take a look what's happening. That's right. So do you have enough time? UA.breakit.xyz. It's XYZ, not what you might think. Um, And meanwhile, we will check the monitoring, right? Because we need to build observable system. Yes, we talked about monitoring. And good monitoring comes in different layers. The first layer we want to check always is APM, application performance monitoring, which provides us some basic technical metrics like CPU usage and metric usage. And so far, it looks good. Let's just refresh it just to be absolutely sure. Yeah, the system is doing good. Like not we're visible regression. Yeah. We only see disk usage. Yeah, but it's not, it's not that bad. It's, it's but normal. But it's not enough, right? We need yeah. to know uh, service level metrics. Uh, of course, because we need to understand what's oh. going on on individual service level, not just with our virtual machines, our containers. Uh, so we need to know how much traffic we get. And we see that we are getting some traffic. People are playing. That's a good sign. Yeah. We should know our latency. We should make sure that yeah. our services are you see healthy. You're playing. Thank you for doing it. It has some like uh, propagation. Uh, 
delay. delay. You, can, you can click, click. Uh, you can reload. There is uh, this off thing. You can click it and get the fresh stuff. Okay, now we're talking business. Okay, that's right. But even that is not enough, right? Yes, because we talked about traces and traces uh, and latency uh, allow you to understand what's happening with individual endpoints, like is this endpoint slow and what is happening with my call flow? Do I have any issues there? But even that, even that might not be providing the full picture because by the end of the day, you want to have business metrics. You want to understand the impact on the, of your code on the whole business. So you need some metrics for a business performance and you need metrics that will provide you an insight into your customer's behavior. Yes, and in fact, it's nearly impossible to build fault tolerance system without proper observability. And it's very important to design your system for observability and transparency from day one. And designed to find not only something that happened, for example, exception is thrown, it's easy to find, right? But design your uh, monitoring to find something that didn't happen. For example, if you didn't record any leaderboard updates in the last two minutes, that means something is wrong with your system. And speaking of leaderboard, I believe we can call a game complete so we can check our leaderboard and make a screenshot and find, uh, find our winner. So the winner is Pilot23. So do we have Pilot23 in the audience? Okay, I can see. I can see you can come and claim your geese after the talk. What's your name? Alexei? Sergei. I was hoping Alexei will win the prize, but anyway. Um, now, please close your phone and listen to the talk, okay? <laughs> and it seems like our system survived our conference test. Which right? is a good sign. Which is a good sign. <laughs> and here you can see some of the code and design patterns we used to make sure our system is fault tolerant. And uh, you can see them on the screen. But truly highly loaded application should be able to handle much more requests, right? Let's review what we could change to make it even more efficient. First of all, right now we are making not a single call, but we are making like hundreds and thousands of requests for gits and clouds. And those requests are exactly the same. They don't change at all. Responses are different all the time. Positions for gits and clouds, they are different. But requests, they're pretty much the same. They are redundant. What if we could send only one request and then Listen for the responses as they come. This looks like streaming solution. And gRPC supports streaming out of the box. Everything you need to do is to add stream modifier when you describe your gRPC service. And this way, you switch from unary APIs from one request, one response to streaming. Now you can send one request and receive multiple responses on the same request. You can just open streaming connection, send one single request, and wait for the responses as they come. And this stream of geese can be even unlimited. But that can be a little bit dangerous because I may not have the capacity to process all these responses. When I do polling, I know if I can process the response. If I can't, I just don't make the request. But with streaming, a server can send too many responses and kill my client. Well, even with streaming, we can tell our server when we are ready to receive responses and how many messages we can process. It's called back pressure, or in gRPC, it's called flow control. We can open streaming connection and then ask a server to send us, for example, up to five messages. And when we process them, we can ask for three more and so on. When we receive them, we can ask for more and more. And flow control or back pressure is a collaboration between consumer and producer, between client and server. It helps us to balance their capacities and make sure none of them is overloaded. And speaking of being asynchronous, why don't make the system fully reactive? We can put a message broker between producer and consumer so producer can write there, like leaving mail in the, back bo uh, in the mailbox and consumer can read from it because reactive systems are great for fault tolerance. And first of all, this topic deserves its own talk or probably multiple talks. It's outside of the scope. And I agree, reactive systems are great. And when we switch to message-driven systems, we decoupled producers from consumers, we decoupled failures. Components are isolated. When server has a fault or an error, client doesn't have to handle it directly, right? No timeouts, no circuit breakers. So client can just wait for the next message in that mailbox while server is recovering. But 
But it comes at a price. Reactive systems are much more complicated. They require more components, which you will need to maintain. Think about dropped messages, duplicated, reordered messages, eventual consistency, managing concurrent states, managing race conditions. It may be much harder to enforce latency limits if you, ho if you have strict SLOs because it's not clear how to calculate latency. I mean, reactive systems are great, but you should think twice if you need them and if you're ready to invest into building them. But if your system is not built to be reactive from day zero, you may be working on a legacy system, for example. It will cost you quite an effort to make it reactive later. And we have reviewed a few solutions to make your system fault tolerant. We have spoken about their pros and cons. But no matter how good your code is, there is only so much traffic one instance can handle. That's right. There are always capacity limits. It's like that door in the Titanic movie. Do you remember this uh, scene at the end of the movie? There was a door, and it didn't have enough capacity to support both Jack and Rose. Or it did have... Have you ever asked yourself why Jack and Rose didn't share the door? Uh, that's simple. According to James Cameron, Jack had to die. It was in the script. But we hope you don't want your system to die. So when you scale your system, you need to understand its capacity. If we go back to Titanic example, you can see it has it totally missed the mark when it came to that practice. They underestimated the capacity, necessary capacity of lifeboats, and it contributed to the tragedy. So we need to provision enough capacity to make sure we can handle our load. Autoscaling is a well-known pattern that addresses this problem. You can add and remove instances, instances as you go without spending too much money on unused capacities, capacity or choking up on traffic spikes. Also, Amazon just released a predictive autoscaling feature. It uses machine learning to provision capacity based on history of your EC2 usage. So if you have a daily peak at 6 p.m., it can detect it and provision peak capacity to help you handle it. I have to make a disclaimer, we haven't tried this in production because it just got available a few days ago, but I, I believe, we believe it's worth looking into. And when you auto scale, you need to understand your bottlenecks. If you're CPU bound, you should auto scale on CPU. If you're network bound, you should auto scale on bandwidth. And even auto scaling is not a silver bullet. Sometimes you should scale ahead of time. It's called pre-scaling. A good example of scaling ahead of time is scaling before holidays or sales or like Black Friday, which is today. When your service is on the brink of failure, scaling and redirecting traffic may create additional stress that can break it. And it can be too late to auto scale. So if you know that you will receive additional traffic, pre-scale. Don't be f And don't be fast to scale down. A traffic drop can be temporary. Make sure the load peak has passed before you decide to scale down. And let's not forget about state, because if your service is 100% stateless, it's easy to scale up or down. But if you have state, you need to decide what you're going to do with that when you destroy an instance or create a new one, because changes in the state may affect the whole system. So we need to be aware of the state and interactions within the system. Right? Yes, we do, because one service may affect other services. And even within one service, you may have parts that can break other parts. It's like with our free GIS versus premium GIS. We may have thousands of free GIS requests that may affect our premium GIS. And how do we fix it? With bulkheads. We need to build a wall between different parts of our system or even within the same service uh, to make sure our different GIS types don't affect each other. So see, our free GIS are dead, but our premium GIS are alive and happy. But Titanic had bulkheads as well. And they had a constructive flow. They let water spill over the top. So when you build your bulkheads, you need to make sure that isolation is real. For example, if you're dealing with in-process bulkheads, you need to use separate thread pools, separate connection pools. You need to avoid using shared resources to the best of your ability. But we almost always have external dependency. And, and my free geese can affect them as well. Army of incoming free geese can overload my dependencies. Can I deal with it just within my process? Uh, actually, you can. You can limit outgoing requests by request type as well. Or if you want, you may keep your code simple and build integrated bulkheads, isolating the whole families of services 
For example, you may have a separate set of geys and cloud and gateway services, and another for, for your premium geys, I mean. And you may have another set for your free geys, and you may scale them independently. You may use different limits to do that. So as you can see, bulk heads are generic patterns. They can be implemented on multiple levels. You can add bulk heads in your code, split in your resources or thread pools. Or you can split your services, or you can go up and implement bulk heads on infrastructure levels. Also, bulk heads help us to limit blast radius. They make sure even when we make an error, it doesn't kill the entire system. They establish boundaries. And natural boundaries for limiting blast radius during deployment may be an availability zone or region. It means when you do deployment, you deploy to zone A first, and then you make sure that your deployment is healthy, doesn't break anything, and only then you proceed with deploying to zone B, zone C, and so on. That limits your blast radius in case of base deployment, so the problem doesn't get propagated to all users at once. Because not limiting blast radius may produce very painful results, like the famous Oregon exploding whale. In 1970, a dead whale ended up on the beach of Oregon. So the engineering team, they had a great engineering idea. They decided to blow the whale up. They put half a ton of dynamite under it, because the more the better, right? Can you and guess what happened? Uh, we will see what happened. We will show you what happened. Is that I well. can give you uh, a sneak peek. It's not nice. So uh, they filmed it. Yes. It's 1970 again. So, so you see whale. Four, you see the countdown, three. three, two, one, and they had this explosion, and then they had the whole beach and even a part of town covered in chunks of dead whale. You, you can see, see them flying. You see them flying, and let's see, let's see, yeah, here is like the beach with parts of whale, a distributed whale. Um, well, it's not a cloud whale, at least. Not a cloud native. But yes, distributed. and you can see, you can check what happened with cars, right? You can see shards of the glass and even broken roofs. So yeah, broken roof is here, collapsed roof. So nice. they, they didn't think about limiting their blast radius, but... No, they definitely... Yeah. Yes, definitely they didn't, but we always should. Yeah, so we always should. Okay, now we can go back to our slides. And if you want to learn more, about this incident, you can check out this website. It's called theexplodingwhale.com. It has the story, it has the video, it has interviews. Well, it's uh, educational at least. So we know that bulkheads and zone-based deployments help us to limit blast radius. And another way of limiting a blast radius is canaries. During a canary deployment, you deploy a new build in parallel with your existing build. And then you redirect a small amount of traffic to your canary. And if something goes wrong, you just redirect your traffic back. But if your deployment is happy, you just redirect the rest of traffic gradually, exposing it to the rest of your users. So we can use canaries, we can use bulkheads, we can use other tools and approaches to make our system fault tolerant. But how do we make sure the solutions work indeed? Well, first of all, we can write tests. But traditional testing is focused on verifying known assumptions. And that might be not enough for complex systems because it's nearly impossible to predict all sources of failures. And even when we know what, what the issue is, we can't always prioritize it properly until it causes a failure. Faults hurt, but only when they happen. If it hurts, do it more often. Absolutely. We can start breaking things on purpose. This discipline is called chaos engineering, and the basic idea of chaos engineering is randomly introducing various types of faults on multiple levels, from instance shutdown to adding latency to simulating CPU burning and uh, I.O. burning to simulating API failures. And introducing chaos helps to explore many unpredictable things that could happen and discover new properties of complex systems. Unknown dependencies, improper or missing fallbacks, retry storms, and so on. You can battle test your database replication and redundancy. You can evaluate and frequently used alerts and their playbooks, and so on. So you can think about it as of immunization. You're teaching your system, your body, to react to a fault by injecting it. And where do I start? You probably don't want to start with breaking your production system, 
But you can start injecting this fault into test or shadow environment. And you start with building more confidence in the system itself. You collect statistics, you find new issues, you improve your system, you add better monitoring, alerts, fallbacks. And when you are finally ready to introduce production faults, you can start injecting them from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday to Thursday, so your engineering team can react to these failures without waking up in the middle of the night. There are tools on the market that help you to, all, to do all that, starting with Simeon Army from Netflix, including Chaos Monkey. Please don't confuse it with monkey coders. They're much more dangerous for your system. And other tools worth looking are Gremlin and Chaos Toolkit. And speaking of testing changes, I have another change I'd like to test. I'd like to try it out. I want to deploy it to production, so... Did you improve the system? I hope so. So let's check, check the metrics. metrics. And yeah. if you want to try out the game, feel free. That's what it is for. So meanwhile, let's check our metrics while yeah, people I'll check are metrics testing first. it. Because, I mean, after deployment, you all during deployment, you always need to check metrics and after deployments as well. Right? I see no regression here. Uh, so. I see no regression, but I'm getting some weird looks from audience. I don't know. They don't like you. I don't know. I'm a pretty I nice guy. Uh, well, I will check later and see. Latency is good, you see? Latency is pretty low. It's clouds. It's uh, less than a few milliseconds. Let's check a uh, fixture latency. But I see some nervous laughter in the audience. It's okay, this is fixture latency. Let me reload it. You see, it's like, it's very nice. Well, it's less than 100 milliseconds. But I see some people that look a little bit unhappy to me. People are always unhappy. Some people just, that's, I mean, just natural. Well, I have that gut feeling. Let's check out the game itself. I have QPS. You see QPS? Well, people it's, are it's, well it's, it's normal. It's not that big, but it works. But something just doesn't add up. So you don't believe metrics, do you? I believe metrics, but I believe there is something bigger, something that we are missing. Okay. Well, I'll show you. You see? I have GIS. Oh, I'll play again. Okay, so leaderboard is there, score is there, geese are not there. Oh, geese is here? Well, but how can you dodge those geese? It's impossible. I'll try. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really impossible. They That's take probably, the full screen. Uh, the boss level, you know? It's, it's the game over level. It obviously an error, visibly incorrect behavior, and our metrics. They didn't help us to discover that, right? So we need to do something about it. We need to find a way, a way to fix it. Shoot them? That's oh. a different game. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, uh, nobody should be harmed. I mean, yes. uh, everybody should survive. Yeah, we, we need to find a way to fix it. No, that's right. And we can schedule a call to our system from an outside location. This call can verify that our func system functionality doesn't break some basic rules. In our case, we can check availability, make sure system is up and reachable. We can check latency slows, latency within required limits, and we can perform a smoke test. We can verify response against some simple business rules. We can verify that GIS are present, and GIS are not taking the entire screen. It makes the game impossible to play. And this pattern is called Prober, and you can take a look at the Cloud Prober tool open sourced by Google. In a nutshell, Prober helps us to verify that system works as expected from consumer's point of view. On top of that, of course, inside our system, we should report business metrics, such as number of geese per line, scores, duration of the game, and not only report them, but compare them against some baseline, against some historical values. This matrix can provide us an insight into user experience. If we had metrics like this, we would have seen that something is wrong and we would, we would make a decision, should we roll back our change or not? Because rolling back the change is a very first thing you may want to consider when dealing with a bad release. And rollbacks should be easy, and fortunately our rollbacks are. So let me roll back my change and test it. And, and when you are rolling back, you should communicate to the rest of your team and then fix the bug without worrying too much. And communication is as important as technical solutions. Without it, people might step on each other's toes or forget something very small but important. Like they did on Titanic when they forgot, forgot to pass a key to a locker with binoculars in it and without, without binoculars. And on top of that, they didn't tell anybody about that. So without binoculars, they didn't notice the iceberg until it was too late. So you see the smallest communication issues can lead to huge catastrophes. And to prevent failures and catastrophes, you need to establish the right culture. People should make the habit of exchanging information. And if you break something, 
or not just something that should be easy to ask for help or advice. And when you face an incident, you will benefit from having real-time conversation. So you must establish roles and communication channels ahead of time. You need to agree on how and where to send those messages, who should respond to them, and within what time limits. How to bring new people into discussion when you need them. How to escalate. So when something bad happens, you don't spend time to find right people and find a way to reach them. And during the incident, please don't be afraid to over-communicate. It's better to come up with a false alarm than to see something and ignore it. And when something bad actually happens, you get a chance to learn. It's okay to have a failure, but it's wrong to have the same failure over and over again and again. So when you have a failure, you need to have a post-mortem. You need to establish a timeline of events that led to this failure so you can find out what caused it. And then you can decide, decide what you can do and what you can fix to make sure this failure doesn't happen again in future. And it's extremely important to keep those post-mortems blameless and constructive. The natural reaction when things go wrong is to find who is guilty. Please don't. Instead, make sure people can exchange information freely. Removing blame from a post-mortem gives people the confidence to bring up issues without fear. Sharing information about mistakes helps others. They can avoid them now. They can learn from somebody else's experience. Collect all the data you have. Track the causes. Share the results of the blameless postmortems. You can even introduce monthly meetings to review postmortems of incidents happened not only on your team, but in your organization or in your entire company. We have those. It makes a great learning opportunity as well as a social event. Free food and drinks never hurt anybody. Let's have a quick postmortem right now. We know we had an incident. We had an unplayable game, and we can establish a timeline. Everything was fine, then I deployed the change, then everything was broken again. And we were kind of lucky because in real system, it takes more than one change to produce a visible error. So good investigation and proper data collection are very important. And I double-checked. I made sure that rolling back a change fixed the issue. And what can we do to prevent it from happening again? So we should report business metrics so we have better understanding of the system state. We should add canaries, they will help us to limit blast radius. And we should add automated rollbacks based on those metrics. Cool, now we know how to improve our system. And I didn't blame you. And we didn't blame anybody. And where is my free beer, by the way? Uh, well, I don't have beer, but I can buy you this famous Kiev cake. I don't drink cakes, sorry. Bad for you. And we also need to make notes, because history of past incidents will become valuable later. It certainly beats the tribal knowledge, like, I believe I have seen an issue like that before, two years ago, or maybe not. So build a knowledge base and act on it. Share the information, keep learning, and keep making your system fault tolerant. And here are some libraries and tools we use to make our system observable and fault tolerant. We believe you may be benefit from them as well. We will share the slides after the talk, and you will be able to find them. And the very, fir the very first link here is GitHub repository with all the code of our demo, so you can check it out as well. And speaking of the code, we would like to thank Evgen, who wrote the code for our front end, for the front end of our, of our demo. So thank you, Evgen. Thank you, Evgeny. And by the way, he is GRPC Web. <laughs> Evgeny. He used GRPC Web that reached general availability like last month, a few weeks ago. So if you're interested, you can check it out. You can make gRPC calls from your web browser. And if you want to learn more about building fault-tolerant systems, you can start with these books. And remember that there is no silver bullet. Good fault tolerance is not achieved overnight. Fault tolerance requires a combination of right code and design patterns, good product decisions, and proper communication culture. And we would like to emphasize that no geese were harmed during the making of this talk. That's why we didn't kill them. Yes. And organizers also asked us to add this rate me slide, and we, of course, improved the slide. So uh, rate us if you can. Or provide the feedback so we can make it better next time. And unfortunately, now we have no time for questions. So come and find us after the talk. And thank you for playing the game and for coming here and listening for our talk. Thank you for being here.